Welcome to Four Scores. I'm your host, John Burlingame. This podcast series brings together the most accomplished film and television composers and reveals the emotional journeys, inspirations, and unique challenges of their work. In this episode, I sat down with Christoph Beck, the Emmy-winning composer and veteran of more than 100 films. His work can be heard in the vibrant scores for Ant-Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp, as well as the global phenomenon Frozen and now Frozen 2. We spoke in his spacious studio complex in Santa Monica, California, about his origins, his work, and why Frozen is much more than a princess movie. Christoph, thanks for being with us today. Truly my pleasure, John. So let's talk about the Frozen films, especially sure. as Frozen 2 has just been released. How did the original one come to you? Had you worked on other Disney films? I had a bit of good luck in that the director of a short film that Disney was making at the time called Paper Man was a fan of mine, knew that he wanted to hire me, and that film went on to win the Oscar for Best Animated Short that year. It was a beautiful film and a real good showcase for, for music. And when it came time for Disney to choose a composer for Frozen, they came to me. I wasn't really sure what to expect. I went in for what I thought was a job interview, and it ended up being more them pitching to me. Uh, well, of course I want to do this. This is, it is the dream of, I imagine, most of my colleagues to score a, a Disney animated feature, that there's so much iconic music and such a storied tradition in all those films that to be a part of it is definitely a kind of a dream come true for a composer. Is it possible to say what in the most general sense is the job of music, the underscore in these Frozen films? Well, I think the job of music in the Frozen films is for the most part and most fundamentally the same as music in any film or any storytelling endeavor. Music is, it's a little bit difficult to talk about because it's so abstract. I believe the famous quote is uh, talking about music is like dancing about architecture. And there's a lot of truth to that. But in the case of, of film scoring, music is really an emotional glue that ties the whole film together. It has a unique ability to take what in a film is a very artificial if you think about it, kind of storytelling style, you're, you're seeing a series of cuts um, from one camera angle to another camera angle. And if you really stop to think about it, that's incredibly unnatural. And what music can do is make it all seamless. It can create a storytelling whole out of disparate parts. And I think that's really the power of music. In Frozen in particular, the musical score as distinct from the songs, can create that more continuous storytelling experience that feels like one piece with a beginning, middle, and an end, as opposed to a series of episodic events. Since you mentioned the songs, um, which in both cases, Frozen 1 and 2, were by uh, Kristen Anderson Lopez and Bobby Lopez, did you work with the songwriters, or did you work with their material? Uh, to what degree is there a, a, a connection between songwriting and score composing. In the first film, there was some interest and excitement in, in having me be part of the arranging of the songs. And in fact, at the time that I went in for my meeting, they played me Let It Go, which was in a demo form created in Kristen and Bobby's studio. And they asked me if I wanted to take a crack at doing an arrangement of it. So the first thing I did on that film before writing a note of score was to do an arrangement of Let It Go. I made a mistake that a lot of composers make when they're first either starting their careers or when they get an opportunity that they get particularly excited about, which is I overwrote. This is something you see over and over again in young composers. They don't understand that a little goes a long way. And I forgot to understand. And I took liberties with the harmonization, I messed around with the phrasing, and I thought I was creating a masterpiece. And what I didn't realize at the time was they just wanted an arrangement of this song, which many people involved in the production had already come to know and love in its demo form. So I turned in my arrangement demo, 
and got on the phone with Bobby and he was he was too polite to tell me, no, Chris, you know, you kind of got it all wrong. We really just need something simpler. I tried one last time and finally Disney called me and said, okay, Chris, we can't wait to hear what you do with the score, but we're good on the arrangement. <laughs> you know, uh, we're going to take care of it from here on out. Thank you. They did have me work on another song, Do You Want to Build a Snowman? And there was a particular reason for that. It was because in the film, there are these breaks in the singing where there are little dialogue bits and the music is more like score than it is just a song. So they had me do that one and that arrangement is in the film. For this one, Frozen 2, there was already a team in place. And, you know, frankly, I was happy to just have the opportunity to focus on the score and not worry about the songs themselves. But I was also very excited to take the thematic material from the songs and intersperse it throughout the score. And I think one thing I love about the songs in Frozen 2, more so than Frozen 1, the melodies lend themselves to instrumental treatment. Many of the songs were just beautiful and very naturalistically translated. And I will say especially the lullaby, which is the first song we hear in the movie, is just a beautiful kind of folksy tune that I found to be very malleable. And that's the one I ended up using the most. I ended up using it as a theme for Elsa and Anna's mom. Let's talk in general about uh, your underscore I, I keep thinking about the locale, the sort of frozen north, vaguely Scandinavian kind of locale. Did that impact or influence anything that you would write uh, in either score? Absolutely. In the first score, um, I should say in the score to the first film, I did a lot of research on Scandinavian instruments. And one of the first instruments that interested me was called the, and I'm sure I'm butchering the pronunciation, the Hardanger fiddle. I happen to have a friend who's a, a colleague of mine who's Norwegian, and I called him up and I asked him about this fiddle. And he was like, oh, don't even bother. It's the ugliest sound. I recommend you steer clear. I ended up buying a cheap one, and it turned out that my friend and colleague was right. It's, it kind of has all the lack of dexterity of the viola without the richness of sound. We found that there was a particular type of singing called kulning that is a kind of a shepherd's call, almost like a, a form of very high-pitched, high-concept yodeling. It's really a haunting and mysterious sound. I was able to incorporate that into the score in a bunch of places. There's also a type of a hunting horn called a bouquet horn that we used for the troll characters in the first film. In the second film, I wanted to expand on that palette and not repeat myself too much. So I wanted to use a type of a flute. And after talking to my favorite woodwind player, Chris Bleth, when he played the gems horn, which is a distant cousin of the ocarina, I was immediately taken with it. That's the sound that we use for the enchanted forest people in Frozen 2. And that comes back in a number of places. Also in Frozen 2, there's a, there's a kind of siren call that is critical to the story. And I wondered if this related back to anything you wrote in the first score. Well, I was inspired by some of the cooling calls that we used in the first score. I have to say, I was excited, but also a little bit sad to see that the cooling played such a large role in Frozen 2 as a story point because it meant that I couldn't use it for my own score. I'm a bit of a hoarder <laughs> with, uh, with my instruments and my ideas. So I, you know, I, I let them have it. Um, um, and in order to keep it clear, we wanted to make sure that the only time we heard that kind of singing was when Elsa could also hear it. It's a kind of a siren call that calls Elsa to these remote lands and sets her off on a journey to discover who she is and where her powers came from and her family's past. It kind of muddied the waters to use it as an element in the score when it was such a prominent element in the story. 
Frozen 2 is, is in many ways like a second act for these characters. And I wonder if because of that, you really had to create a lot of new material that maybe doesn't necessarily relate to the first story. Absolutely. I wanted to make sure with this second film that I spent time developing strong themes for the characters. In the first film, it was my first animated feature film. I was not aware of the actual process that occurs when scoring an animated film, which is unlike a live action film. In a live action film, at a certain point in post-production, they kind of present you with the movie. Is there still might be a lot of editing left to do, but there's a movie with a beginning and a middle and an end. Um, in animation, you do get a sense of what the movie is going to be like, but at the beginning of the process, none of the animation is finished. In fact, much of it hasn't even begun. It's very difficult to get into the nuances of what the scene is when the, the visuals are so crude. But one by one, individual scenes come in. And while I'm very proud of the first score, and it does have themes that I feel are strong and that I'm proud of, um, I never had the opportunity to really sit down and think it through the way I did in Frozen 2. I was much better prepared. So there are a number of new themes in the second film. There's a theme for the Enchanted Forest people called the North Ultra, which you often hear on the Gems Horn. There's a new theme for Elsa and Anna, that kind of sisterly love theme that's very heartfelt and simple. And there's um, a new theme for Elsa too that accompanies her uh, on this journey of self-discovery that I specifically wanted to make so that it could be heroic, but also a little bit melancholy and to capture that feeling of, of searching and longing. There's also a motif that I used repeatedly in the first film that I developed into a, a full-length theme for Olaf that you hear during key moments over the course of Olaf's story arc in this film as well. You know, speaking of Olaf, uh, he's, uh, he's a funny character. And I'm Most certainly. And, and I'm always curious to know, what's the composer's job when you deal with funny scenes or funny characters? Does the music have to be funny? Or do you stay out of the way of the comedy? Or is it a kind of case-by-case -case call? It's definitely a case-by-case -case call. And it's particularly interesting for you to ask that question about this movie because that was something that, that we went back and forth on. When we first started working on the music, the idea was that this was a more mature, more dramatic Frozen than the first one. As a composer, it is always more fun to write quote unquote mature and dramatic music that can add uh, a layer of emotion to the picture that isn't already there. And truthfully, funny music under a scene that isn't funny doesn't necessarily make it that much funnier. <laughs> It's still an unfunny scene, maybe with funny music under it. So at first, I really took that to heart. And so did Chris and Jen, the directors. And we made a kind of decision to stay out of the way of all the comedy. We all got a little too excited about making this version of Frozen darker and more mature. And maybe we kind of forgot that it's Disney and that Disney films should appeal to a broad audience, including kids. So we all went back to the drawing board somewhat. They put in some new scenes that featured Olaf and other characters, but really brought out the, the comedic aspects of the story. And I went ahead and did what I could to emphasize those comedy moments. The first time we see Olaf early on in the film, I think I went uh, back and rewrote that particular underscore five or six times until we found the right balance of music that wasn't hitting you over the head, but that was still light enough so that it gives permission for the audience to laugh. Mm -hmm. It's a beloved character from the first film. The first time we see him, we just wanted to say, hey, this is the Olaf you know and you love, and it's okay to laugh. Four Scores is brought to you by the Four Scores Playlist. Featuring music and interview clips from each composer featured in the podcast series, including Christoph Beck's music from Frozen, Frozen 2, Ant-Man, and Ant-Man and the Wasp. The Four Scores playlist is available on all major music streaming services. Experience the magic behind the music you love whenever you want.
So you're Canadian by birth, correct? Correct. What brought you to America and how did you get involved in the film scoring business? I came to America to go to college. I went to Yale and I kind of fell into film scoring. I had rock star dreams growing up uh, in high school. I was kind of a chubby, unpopular music nerd at the time in my fantasies. You know, whenever I got picked on, I would think, oh, just wait till I get my record deal and become famous and I'll show them. When I got to college, I realized that um, fantasy was not quite meeting up with reality. I was lacking, and still am lacking, a few basic skills required for rock stardom, like ability to write lyrics, ability to sing, um, <laughs> and ability to feel at all comfortable on stage in front of large groups of people. So. My heart was really in musical theater at the time. My brother, who is a rock star, goes by the name Chili Gonzalez. He's he's based in uh, Germany. He and I were really into musicals at the time, and we wrote a couple musicals. And I was very interested in applying to the NYU musical theater program, but th they only took students every two years, and it was an off year. So I needed to find something to do for a year. Um, and I was literally in the guidance office at Yale University going through pamphlets and a, a, a single page fell out of like another brochure and it was for the USC film scoring program. And I thought I could check it out, see if I like it. And if I don't take to it, you know, I'll have a chance to apply for the NYU program. Of course, I came out to L.A., I did the USC program, and never looked back and never thought about Broadway again, really. Wow. So then film scoring immediately appealed to you once you sort of got your feet wet. Absolutely, it did. I can remember a moment when I first moved to L.A. before my classes started, and I had just gone to the, the local music equipment store and bought myself a keyboard and a, a VHS a videotape machine, and was just setting up my studio. And my roommates and I were watching Die Hard, the original Die Hard with Bruce Willis. And there's a scene in that movie where the main character, Bruce Willis, plays, walks across a room that is covered with broken glass and he has bare feet. And I noticed that there was no music in the scene. And I know now, um, having the experience that I do and being something of a film music professional, I now know that the choice to not have music in a scene like that is very deliberate and of course very effective. But at the time I thought to myself, whoa, there's, there's no music here. You know, what happens if I turn on my keyboard and rewind the scene and try something? And that's just what I did. I pulled up uh, what I'm sure was a very cheesy 80s string sound on my Korg M1 and I placed my hand on the right side of the keyboard and pressed a bunch of notes really close together to make a cluster. Um, that is a totally, again, you know, now with the knowledge of 20 years of experience, more than 20, I now know that that is a pretty much a, a horror movie cliche. But at the time when I did that, it was a transformative moment for me. It totally changed the way the scene played and I felt superhuman. I felt like I had musical superpowers, storytelling superpowers, and it was intoxicating. You know, my classes started shortly thereafter, and I realized that the, the combination of that artistic reward of being such an integral part of telling a story with the, the fit of the job and my personality. You know, I'm not, I'm not an extrovert. I don't I don't like saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. I kind of like being behind the scenes. I'm not a spotlight seeker. So it was really a perfect fit. And I, and I realized that pretty early on in my, uh, in my studies at USC. Has the success of these films surprised you? And in any way, has it changed your career? Um, most definitely. I can pretty much trace my career to two stages. I can divide it up into two phases, let's say. You know, there's pre-frozen and post-frozen. As a composer, to work on a film that is that successful gives you credibility as a composer for, for big studio movies. If there was ever any hesitation before Frozen for me to work on a film like Ant-Man, for example, that was gone. 
at that time. You know, all they had to do was look at my credits list and see that Frozen was there. It's one of the most successful films of all time. Certainly one of the most successful animated films of all time. And that puts me in a club that I wasn't a member of before. When I first saw the original Frozen, it was in a very early stage, and they hadn't um, solved many of the problems that they were trying to solve with the story. And I, you know, I, I, I was to learn much later in my career, as I do more and more of these animated films, that it's, it's pretty typical when you look at a very early version of an animated film that it's a bit of a mess. And I remember thinking I had just seen Wreck-It Ralph and I loved Wreck-It Ralph. I thought it was so, such a fresh take for Disney. Um, and it got me really excited. And then I saw Frozen and I'm thinking, okay, I'm so happy that I'm finally getting to do my first Disney animated movie, but why does it have to be this dumb princess movie? Like, <laughs> why couldn't it have been Wreck-It Ralph? Um, of course, over the next year, I watched Disney work their magic and shape the story into something that is now, of course, timeless classic and was huge and I wouldn't trade it for anything. So you mentioned Ant-Man and I want to talk about your uh, role in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. You've done both Ant-Man and uh, the sequel Ant-Man and the Wasp and these films seem to me sort of be to be sort of far afield from the world of Frozen, and yet in a way, it's still a kind of fantasy uh, story. Is that how you see it? How different is it to score a Marvel superhero movie? It's not as different as you might think. The films are obviously totally different, but in the end, it's storytelling through music. And in the case of Marvel and Disney, there are certain sounds associated with those franchises that as a composer you are somewhat obligated to continue it's going to be an orchestra if you're working on a disney film it would make no sense to come to the table with you know an ensemble of eight tubas and a kazoo <laughs> um, very similarly for marvel there's a certain expectation of a certain sound in the case of the ant-man films i got lucky because as a composer, you always look for something to hang your hat on stylistically that can distinguish the music you're about to write from other similar scores. And in the case of the Ant-Man movies, they're heist movies, especially the first one. And then the, the comedy in those films as well. Paul Rudd is a comedic actor. and There's a lot of laughs in both of those movies. I was able to sort of latch on to those two elements and create a score that had a certain lightness to it, and more importantly, had certain nods to classic heist scores of the 60s and 70s. Use of percussion, use of, of certain spy-ish sounds like vibraphone, alto flute, and just keeping things light and groovy. None of the other Marvel films had opportunities to kind of embrace those elements. What role did director Peyton Reed play in all of this? I think maybe it's important to talk about uh, the director-composer relationship. You're uh, working for someone, clearly. What's the collaboration like? Peyton was involved in every facet of the creation of the score for both films. We would get together about once a week, and he would discuss in detail what each piece of music was doing, where it was working for him, and where... From a storytelling perspective, maybe I wasn't emphasizing the right parts of the story or it just wasn't working with what his idea of what he was trying to say was. A big part of my job is experimenting and then being willing to just throw those experiments out and start over. And that was certainly the case on the first Ant-Man where both of us in our um, you know, non-professional music fan lives love high concept glitchy electronic music. Uh, your listeners won't be able to see it, but you can see behind me a giant synthesizer that I love playing with to make noises, sounds, things that I could probably never use in my professional work, but that excite me as a musician. And we kind of latched on to the idea of representing the insect nature of this character. Some of the other characters in the films 
with a kind of skittery, high concept, electronic, glitchy sound. And I wrote three pieces and we played them for Kevin Feige, who's the, the head honcho at Marvel, who is a big soundtrack fan, knows his stuff. And he said, well, Chris, that sounds great, but you know, I'm, I don't usually like music that makes me feel like my speakers are broken. <laughs> and I'll never forget that quote, because um, A, it was funny, um, but B, he was right. It was, it was just a little too far afield for, for what the movie was trying to do. And we just kind of hit the reset button Peyton and I together, and that's when, you know, I, I embraced the more classic heist feel. Boy, I'm glad we did. I feel like that approach worked much better, and um, very, very excited with how both those scores turned out. To step back for a second, in general, do comic book-based movies require different approaches than straightforward dramatic narratives involving what we might call real people? <laughs> well. I find that the music for characters that are exaggerations of real life, and of course superheroes by definition are such characters, require a bit of an exaggerated approach with the music as well. You can't go too crazy or else it starts to feel like the music is leading the story, but I would say there's, there's that heightened reality aspect of it. Does melody writing come easily to you? Uh, no. <laughs> because is, that, that Ant-Man theme is so memorable. It's so catchy. That theme has been in my head all day, and I love it. Oh, thank you very much. Um, I find that theme writing is a lot like working on a film set. You wait, and you wait, and you're bored, and you wait, and you wait, and then boom, you got to get going. It's just hours of boredom punctuated by moments of sheer terror. <laughs> um, my process when I'm working on themes is to is to workshop, listen, meditate, and wait for something to really strike. If you were to just zero in on that moment, and I actually remember the exact moment that the tune for the first Ant-Man theme came to me, and it came to me all in a flood. The first element of the Ant-Man theme that existed was the, the fanfare part of it. Um, if I may assault your listeners' ears for a moment, the part that goes da 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 na da 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 na, that part was done. I was really jazzed about that. It was fun. It was energetic, and literally for several weeks, I was just ruminating on this fanfare in my head. And when the actual tune came into my head, it was away from the piano, away from the keyboard. I was sitting at my desk, and. I remember this distinctly. I just grabbed a piece of sheet music and wrote it out real quick and then put it aside and forgot about it so that I could come back to it the next day with fresh ears and see if, you know, what I had done the day before was any good. And I guess it was. Yes, it passed muster. <laughs> I'm very pleased to say. You know, these films are loaded with action. And I sometimes wonder how you as a composer keep up the pace and the necessary drive without resorting to the same music over and over again. That's a great question. And you've illuminated one of the biggest challenges of composing in general, but film composing in particular. How do you take a three minute action sequence and balance the need for it not to feel repetitive with the idea that it needs to feel cohesive, that it needs to feel like one piece. And for me, I think that comes from my love of pop music. I think a lot in terms of clarity of structure. And I reference pop music because I tend to think in terms of verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. The classic pop song structure. That is how I like to think of my film music cues. Typically, if the film is half decent, there'll be pivotal moments where something shifts, where the, where the advantage shifts from our hero to the villain or vice versa, or something unexpected happens. So I try to identify where those shifts are. And those are my markers for where I'll go from my 
quote unquote verse to my quote unquote chorus and then back to the verse. It's this amazing combination of the new and the familiar that I think really stirs up emotion in me anyway as a listener. And so I a lot of times think of writing an extended action cue in that way. You know, when I get to the third section of uh, a big action cue, it's going to be like the first, but there's going to be, quote unquote, the band rocking out behind it this time. Although, of course, in the case of Disney and Marvel, you're going to be talking about elements of the orchestra and certain orchestrational devices that enter that we didn't hear the first time, but that enhance what is familiar from the first time. I, I know you're also involved in giving back to the community, helping young people, helping young composers. Can you talk about uh, this part of your life, what you've been doing, and why it's important to you? Um, absolutely. I needed a break a few years ago, just doing a little too much work and needed to recharge my batteries. I took six months off, and during that time, I had an opportunity to reflect on the business I was in and my place in it. And, it, you know, it had always been something that was nagging me at the, in the back of my mind throughout my time coming up in the business that, you know, we were an awful lot of white dudes. And I always thought, you know, one day, maybe, if I have time, if I have money, I could do something about it. And that one day maybe became today. I had the time. This was after the first Frozen, so I had some money. And I talked to a lot of people about what we could do. You know, I decided that there were two ways I could help. One of the problems is young composers who are women or composers of color, they don't see a lot of people who look like they do in the business, and so it doesn't even occur to them to go into the business, and for many of them, they don't even know it exists. I feel like I can help, in a small way, expose uh, the amazing opportunities for music making and for making a living to these young composers. So I've been teaching high school kids in LA, in fact, just to get them excited about my industry and to, to let them know that you know, there's a whole universe of music making that's available to them should they choose to pursue it, should they get excited by it. I've set up a, a nonprofit, the Key Change Foundation, and we are going to subsidize the music budgets of low-budget films that have already made the decision to hire a composer from one of these disadvantaged groups and just try to give them just a small leg up. I think that's great. And, Thanks. And, and thank you for doing that. Chris, you've been at this now for more than 20 years. And according to my count, more than 100 films. Everything from The Hangover to Pitch Perfect to The Muppets. What do you enjoy most about this business? What's it meant to you? Well, I think back to that moment when put that string cluster under Bruce Willis walking across the room and just how intoxicating that was. And I feel incredibly grateful that I get to experience that feeling. You know, I've been able to provide for myself, for my family, for people I care about, doing something I love. And, you know, there's, I wouldn't trade that for anything. Chris, thanks for being with us today. Thank you, John. Thank you for listening to Four Scores. Please subscribe and make sure to share this episode with your music-loving friends. It'd also be great if you can rate it because that really helps others find the series. See you next time. Watch Frozen, Frozen 2, Ant-Man, and Ant-Man and the Wasp and listen to the soundtracks wherever movies and music are enjoyed.